All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to take Second Chronicles chapter 10, and we'll just jump straight into it. Uh, Rehoboam and the nation at Shechem. In the first five verses, the elders of Israel offer Rehoboam the throne of Israel. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it. He was in Egypt, for where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon, that Jeroboam returned from Egypt. Then they sent for him and called him. And Jeroboam and all Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us, and we will serve you. So he said to them, Come back to me after three days. And the people departed. So this was a logical continuation of the Davidic dynasty. David was succeeded by his son Solomon, and now Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, was assumed to be the next king. And Rehoboam was the only son of Solomon that we know by name. Solomon had thousand wives and concubines, yet we read of one son he had to bear up his name, and he was a fool, right? This demonstrates that sin is a bad way of building up a family, and it's difficult to believe that he had no other sons, yet it is in fact that Rehoboam is the only one mentioned in 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 10. Shechem was a, hit, uh, was a city with rich history. Abraham worshipped there in Genesis chapter 12, verse 6. Jacob built an altar and purchased land there in Genesis 33, verses 18 through 20. Joseph was buried there in Joshua chapter 24, verse 32. And it was also the geographical center of the northern tribes. All in all, it showed that Rehoboam was in a position of weakness, having to meet the ten northern tribes on their territory, instead of demanding that representatives come to Jerusalem. So Jeroboam was mentioned previously in 1 Kings chapter 11 verses 26 through 40. God told him through a prophet that he would rule over a portion of a divided Israel. So naturally Jeroboam was interested in Solomon's successor. He was specifically part of the group of elders that addressed Rehoboam. And Solomon was a great king but he took a lot from the people. The people of Israel wanted relief from the heavy taxation and forced service of Solomon's reign, and they offered allegiance to Rehoboam if he agreed to this. God warned Israel about this in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 10-19, through 19, when, through Samuel, the Lord spoke of what a king would take from Israel. After the warning, the people still wanted a king, and now they knew what it was like to be ruled by a taking king. Sadly, the elders of Israel made no spiritual demand or request on Rehoboam. So seemingly, the gross idolatry and apostasy of Solomon didn't bother them at all. So strangely, though Solomon must have had many sons, none is mentioned except Rehoboam, whom he begot by Namad the Ammonitus in 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 21. And having no doubt since the increasing spirit of alienation on the part of the Israelites in the northern part of the kingdom against his father, Rehoboam went to Shechem to be formally uh, coronated. And this city had held an important part of Israel's life since the time of Abraham, right? Joshua had reaffirmed the Mosaic Covenant there, and from that time, Shechem had been more or less the unofficial capital of the north. In Joshua chapter 24, verses 1 through 28. And so Jeroboam was formerly the foreman of labor in Ephraim, in which Shechem was located. So when he heard that Solomon had died, he returned from Egypt, where he had fled from Solomon sometime previously in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 26 through 28, and verse 40. So by popular demand, Jeroboam headed a delegation which appealed to Rehoboam to lighten their load of labor and taxation, 2 Chronicles chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. And he asked for three days to consider the matter. And Rehoboam consulted with the old advisors of his father, who counseled him to listen to the Israelites. So here comes the continual downfall from this point forward. So verses 6 and 7, the counsel from Rehoboam's older advisors. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived, saying, How do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him, saying, If you are kind to these people and please them and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. So wisely, Rehoboam asked for the counsel of these older, experienced men. They seemed to advise Solomon well, so it was fitting that Rehoboam asked for their advice. And the elders knew that Rehoboam was not Solomon, and could not expect the same from the people that Solomon did. So Rehoboam had to relate to the people based on who he was, not on who his father was. If he showed kindness and a servant's heart to the people, they would love and serve him forever. Right? This is good advice. So he turned 
to his own young peers who urged him not to relent, but rather to make the people's yoke all the heavier. All right, verses 8 through 11, the counsel from the Rehoboam's younger advisors. All right, they're going to say differently. But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him. And he said to them, What advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father put on us? Then the young man who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you should speak to the people who have spoken to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So... (coughs) Before Rehoboam ever consulted with younger men, he rejected the advice of the elders, right? And this is a common phenomenon today, what some call advice shopping, right? The idea is that you keep asking different people for advice until you find someone who's going to tell you what you want to hear. This is an unwise and ungodly way to get counsel. It is better to have a few trusted counselors that you will listen to, even when they tell you that, you know, they're going to tell you what you don't want to hear. And these men were much more likely to tell Rehoboam what he already thought by turning to those likely to think just like he did. And it shows that Rehoboam only asked for advice for the sake of appearances. So their unwise advice shows the wisdom of seeking counsel from those outside our immediate situation and context. Sometimes an outsider can see things more clearly than those who share our same experiences. The young men who use um, who Rehoboam preferred to turn were probably some of Solomon's many sons, right? Rendered callous by the upbringing in the luxurious harem and court at Jerusalem. And so the younger men offered the opposite advice to the elders. They wanted an adversarial approach, one that would make Rehoboam more feared than Solomon was. So Solomon did ask a lot out of Israel in both taxes and service, yet we don't have the impression that Israel followed Solomon out of fear, but out of a sense of shared vision and purpose. They believed in what Solomon wanted to do and were willing to sacrifice to accomplish it. Rehoboam, on the other hand, did not appeal to any sense of shared vision and purpose. He simply wanted the people to follow his orders out of the fear of a tyrant. And so he attempted to continue the despotism of his father, though he lacked his father's refinement and ability to fascinate. And with a dozen rash words, Rehoboam, the bungling dictator, opened the door for 400 years of strife, weakness, and eventually the destruction of the entire nation. And so my little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. A targum translates this as my weakness shall be stronger than the might of my father. So Rehoboam's young advisor said that his heavier burden would be like his little finger being thicker than his father's waist and like scorpions, right? A cruel kind of whip with the sharp pieces of metal in it, right? Compared with his father's whips. So he's going to be a tyrant. All right, verses 12 through 15, Rehoboam answers Jeroboam and the elders of Israel harshly. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king had directed, saying, Come back to me the third day. Then the king answered them roughly. King Rehoboam rejected the the advice of the elders, and he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to it. My father chastised you with whips, but I'm going to chastise you with scourges. So the king did not listen to the people, for the turn of events was from God, that the Lord might fulfill his word, which he had spoken by the hand of Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So in this case, right, the king didn't listen to the people. In this case, Rehoboam clearly should have listened to the people. This is not to say that a leader should always lead by popular vote, but a leader needs the wisdom to know when what the people want is best for them. And Rehoboam was a fool. Ironically, his father Solomon worried about losing all he worked for under a foolish successor. Right? Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 18 and 19 states, Then I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun, because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool? Yet he will rule over all my labor in which I toiled, and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. So Rehoboam was a fool, and through his folly, he lost his kingdom. He is not the only example on record. The Stuarts lost the realm of England much in the same way. And Livy saith, when a state is ripe for ruin, that all wholesome counsels are fatally but foolishly slighted. 
So God managed this whole series of events, but he did not make Rehoboam take this unwise and sinful action. God simply left Rehoboam alone and allowed him to make the critical errors his sinful heart wanted to make. And it seems to be altogether a piece of human folly and passion, but now we are suddenly brought into a presence of God and told that beneath the plottings and plannings of man, he was carrying out his own eternal purpose. And he makes the wrath of man to praise him. He weaves the uh, malignant wort of Satan into his own plans, right? God will use our successes and failures regardless. His plan unfolds nonetheless. So notice also, dear friends, that God is in events which are produced by the sin and the stupidity of men. This breaking up of the kingdom of Solomon into two parts was the result of Solomon's sin and Rehoboam's folly, yet God was in it. This thing is from me, saith the Lord. Right? God had nothing to do with the sin or the folly, but in some way, which we can never explain, in a mysterious way in which we are to believe without hesitation, God was in it all. He already knew. So this, the chronicler wrote, was of God, however, for he was already promised Jeroboam that he would rule over the northern tribes in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 29 through 39. All right, verses 16 and 17, Jeroboam is going to lead those leaving Rehoboam's rule. So now when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to your tents, O Israel, now see to your own house, O David. So all Israel departed to their tents, but Rehoboam reigned over the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of Judah. So Rehoboam's foolishness made Israel reject not only Rehoboam, but also the entire dynasty of David. They rejected the descendants of Israel's greatest king. And this signals the division of the 12 tribes into two kingdoms. You have the northern kingdom made up of 10 tribes and the southern kingdom made up of Judah and Benjamin. Right, so everybody disassociated themselves with the house of David, right? To your tents, O Israel, Second Samuel chapter 20, verse 1 for that. And in effect, they declared their independence of Judah. All right, verses 18 19, Israel rebels against the house of David. Then King Rehoboam sent Hadaram, who was in charge of revenue, but the children of Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Therefore King Rehoboam mounted his chariot in haste to flee in Jerusalem. So Israel had been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. So apparently Rehoboam did not take the rebellion seriously until this happened. When his chief tax collector was murdered, he knew that the ten tribes were serious about their rebellion. Hadaram was the wrong man for Rehoboam to send. He was famous for his harsh policy of forced labor in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 6, and chapter 5, verse 14. And he's probably one of the most hated figures in the land, an embodiment of oppression. And Rehoboam probably sent Hadaram because he wanted to make good on his promise to punish those who opposed him. His tough guy policy didn't work. And Rehoboam makes one pathetic effort to restore unity, perfectly illustrating the poverty of his policy. And so from this point on in the history of Israel, the name Israel referred to the ten northern tribes, and the name Judah referred to the southern tribes of Benjamin and Judah. So we have the northern and southern kingdoms now. And there was a long-standing tension between the ten northern uh, tribes and the combined group of Judah and Benjamin. There were two earlier rebellions along this line of potential division. In the days after Absalom's rebellion in 2 Samuel chapter 19 verses 40 through 43, which developed into the rebellion of Sheba in 2 Samuel chapter 20 verses 1 and 2. So Rehoboam ought to have been thankful that God's love to David had left him even the two tribes. So so serious was the cleavage that Adinaram or uh, Hebrew has Hadaram a variant spelling, probably the new work manager over Ephraim in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 6. He was stoned to death by the Israelites when Rehoboam sent him to uh, sent them to arbitrate their differences. All right, that ties up chapter 10. Next time we'll get into chapter 11, and we'll continue talking about the kingdom being divided. Thank you for joining me.